The ambivalent blessing of the digital age is the deluge of information that screams for our attention from every pixelated corner of the environment. I am a child of the analog age, and part of me will eternally resent the, the progression, if that is the word, from the term work or article to the word content. <laughs> what exactly, we might ponder, does this content contain? <laughs> or does it simply mean that we are to be content? The best of this material competes with a tsunami of half-formed opinion, misinformation, distractionary meandering, and the ubiquitous hot take. In short, it's often difficult for even outstanding work to stand out. It is a particular compliment to Nicole Hannah-Jones that I recall not only my first encounter with her work, but my keen recognition that her article, Living Apart, was work, not content. In the midst of the contentious 2012 presidential race, Nicole had delved into a little recognized legacy of George Romney, the former Michigan governor and father of GOP nominee Mitt, as a stalwart defender of the principle of fair housing. The article displayed the qualities that have come to be hallmarks of Nicole's work. A deep awareness of history accompanied by archival investigation, a commitment to restraint, arguing only what the evidence will allow, a clarity of reasoning, and a less common trait, an understanding of tragedy and the ways in which it might be or might have been averted. In the maelstrom of Ferguson, Nicole brought her analytical and journalistic abilities to bear on the Ferguson Florissant School District, highlighting the fact that an entire generation of black children had matriculated through the system since it lost its accreditation. Her work made intelligible a dynamic I'd observed there in my reporting, that while outside media and even statewide office holders came to Ferguson in the summer of 2014 to talk about the shooting of Michael Brown, its residents were as concerned about issues like housing and education as they were the particulars of police use of force. They understood, as Nicole's work illustrated, that there was a linear relationship between the institutions that served Ferguson the color of the people who relied upon those institutions, and outcomes like the confrontation on Canfield Drive between a police officer and an 18-year-old graduate who was now buried in a cemetery just yards away from the failing high school he attended. I give this context to establish the fact that Nicole's article, Choosing a School for My Daughter in a Segregated City, is not a one-off in its brilliance. Two weeks after his testimony in the Brown versus Board of Education case had made him one of the most famous psychologists in the country, Kenneth Clark turned his attention to desegregating the schools of New York City. He met with an indignant response from the New York City Board of Education, which declared that the city did not have a school segregation problem. It had a housing segregation problem, and that school enrollments simply reflected that. This is the equivalent of saying someone did not die from the stabbing, but rather they died from the bleeding. <laughs> this is one of the great benefits of Nicole's examination of the subject, laying bare the conceit that housing segregation and educational outcomes are distinct, that privilege is a matter of happenstance, not a reflection of deliberate policy decisions that compound like interest, producing outcomes that we see but refuse to recognize. There are causes and effects in Nicole's work. And in addition to providing us with the adorable image of her daughter, Nadja, on the cover of the New York Times Magazine, we should recognize Nicole for pointing out the implications in this city and many others across the country of failing to heed the cause of educational integration that Clark pointed out six decades ago. For this reason, and many others, I am proud to present my friend and colleague, Nicole Hannah-Jones, with the 2017 Hillman Award for Magazine Journalism. Thank you for that. It's, it's uh, a tremendous honor to be in the presence of such great and powerful journalism and among some of the journalists that I admire the most. Um, I'd like to quickly thank my husband, Fraji, who's sitting out there looking all dapper. He picked that outfit out himself, too, so I'm really proud of that. <laughs> um, 
you know, Fragi has been my number one supporter moving across the country with me as I've pursued my career. And he certainly didn't expect that our uh, arguments in our house about where we were going to send our daughter would one day be in the pages of the New York Times Magazine. So I appreciate uh, your grace and understanding that the story and, and the struggle of what we were going through are the same things that so many parents were going through. And by sharing and, and making ourselves vulnerable, hopefully we can make the world a little bit better for uh, all the children in the city. So since the election, we've heard over and over that uh, how important journalism is and that we are uh, realizing and recognizing that journalism is more important than ever, that we are in some ways in unprecedented times. And I agree with that, but I also think that is a little bit hyperbolic. And I'm gonna dampen that down a little bit as tends to be my nature. The work that is honored tonight has shown how important it is to hold power accountable, particularly when we have someone unpredictable in the White House. But for millions and millions of Americans, the country that we think is a new country is really the old country to them. It's a country that they've always known. And for the last eight years, as I've chronicled housing segregation and school segregation, that's been under a progressive administration, and it's often been in progressive cities. There are millions of Americans who have long felt betrayed by their country as they've struggled in segregated schools and segregated housing, drunk from poisonous fountains, as they fear that their children or maybe themselves would be shot down by the police. So I think it's important to also keep perspective that yes, journalism is more important now, but it's always been important and it's always been important to write about the people whom we ignore. When I started writing about segregation five years ago full time, there were very few reporters who were writing about this. Though if you opened your eyes, you could see it and it's damaging effects everywhere. When we ignore the needy, when we ignore the weak, instead tell the stories of the powerful, we as journalists become complicit in the systems that are oppressing those people. For five years, I've been writing about kids who we've promised that education would be the great equalizer, that education would be the thing that could transform their lives. And instead, we've given them an education that's only solidified their caste, that's failed to give them hope. I was in Alabama and I wrote about Delisha, who spent 13 years of her education in public schools where she never had the honor or the ability to sit with a classmate who didn't look just like her. I wrote about Brooklyn, where all of these white progressive people who say they believe in equality and integration fought tooth and nail to keep their children out of a school with the children of their black neighbors. And I've just gotten back from Detroit, where in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, there are children who have no textbooks, who have broken windows, who have no heat, who have mold on the walls and mold in their food, and they understand what this country thinks about them by the schools that we have put them in. So I think it's important to remember what I think is so great about the Hillman Awards is the Hillman Awards pay attention to this type of work. It's the work that's not sexy. It's the work where, Lord knows if you know me, I don't expect anything's gonna change from what I write. Um, but you have to do that work anyway. And people often ask me, if you're such a pessimist, why do you keep doing what it is that you do? And my answer is very simple. Whether we're going to change it or not, I'm not going to let us ignore what it is that we're doing to children in this country. So I'm going to leave with a quote from James Baldwin, and I'm going to offer it both as a bomb and as a charge. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Thank you. Thank you.